Hi, welcome back to General Chemistry. My name is Chuck White. Today we're going to talk about some techniques for solving problems in chemistry. The key concepts in this lesson are learning good techniques for solving problems, and we'll go over two examples, one from chemistry and one not from chemistry. The first thing to recognize that is that chemistry is a discipline that's based largely on solving problems. That's good. In industry, uh, they value people who can size up a problem and solve it uh, to make manufacturing easier, cheaper, better for society, all sorts of reasons. So having good problem-solving skills is a very valuable career skill, at least in chemistry. So that we're going to cover two uh, things in this lesson. One is to learn a set of good techniques, and the second is to practice, practice, practice. So to establish good technique, it's important to follow these general steps. First, state the problem. It sounds simple, but um, it's important to keep your eye on the ball and really focus on what you're trying to accomplish in the problem. So what are you trying to find or calculate? And then second, make just a ballpark estimate of the answer. Step two, review the data. What information about this problem is actually known? Step three, work backwards from the desired solution to the data. So ask yourself, what would I need to know in order to calculate the answer to this question? What intermediate piece of information that you don't have would you really need to know in order to calculate um, the answer? Second, work forwards from the data. Ask yourself, how could I obtain this missing information based on the known data that I have? Number five, Identify a complete pathway, a conceptual way to compute the answer, even though you haven't plugged in any numbers to a calculator yet. Number six, work your way through the math to perform the calculation from the data to the desired solution, in, that is to say, in a forward direction. And number seven, check your answer. Ask yourself, is this answer reasonable? Does it agree with the estimate that I made at the beginning? And secondly, do the units of the answer make sense? So let's consider a couple of examples. The first example is a non-chemistry question, and it involves uh, splitting the cost of a meal at a restaurant with some friends. So let's suppose that you and four friends go to a restaurant and you share two pizza pies. Each pizza pie has a listed cost on the menu of $11.75. After calculating the tax at 6.5% and the tip at 17%, how much does each person owe if you split the tab equally among the five of you? Okay, so the problem is how much is each share of the tab? That's what we want to calculate. And an approximate solution would be, well, when tax and tips are, tip are included, each pizza, um, which is listed at almost $12, would actually turn out to be nearly $15. There are two pizzas, so the total bill should be somewhere in the neighborhood of $30. If we split that five ways, each person will owe about $6. And so we anticipate in, in beginning that each share of the cost is going to be about $6. So now step two is to review the data or the known information. There are five people, two pizzas, we know the cost of each pizza, we know the tax rate, and we know the tip rate. So we're ready to go. Now, step three is to work backwards. So if I have, if I want to know each share, the cost of each share of this meal, then I know that at the end I'm going to have to divide by five once I know the total cost but I don't really know the total cost yet, and so I'm going to go to step forward, step four, and work forwards. And so in order to calculate the total cost, I'm going to take um, the cost of each pizza, uh, which is $11.75, multiply by that by two. And that'll give me the subtotal cost of the pizza. Next, I'm going to multiply by 1.065, which is the effective tax rate, to get the total amount of money that I'm going to owe the cashier at the restaurant. But that's still not the, the total cost. The total cost uh, is 
uh, the cashier total plus the amount of the tip um, that I, that we leave together. And so to form a complete pathway, I need to multiply the cashier cost by 1.17 for this 17% tip to get the total cost. Now I have a complete conceptual pathway all the way from the data uh, on the left-hand side to the blue rectangle, which is the thing that I want to calculate in the end. So now we have to do the math. So we take 11.75 times 2. That means the pizza is going to cost uh, $23.50. Then I calculate um, with the tax that the total that I owe the cashier is $25.03. Then I calculate the with the tip, uh, that's going to come to $29.28. And finally, when I divide by 5, each share of this meal is going to be $5.86 if we split it evenly. So now when, in step 7, I want to check my answer. I originally estimated that each share would be $6. And in the final analysis, I calculated that each share is $5.86. That means I have a reasonable value and the correct units in dollars, and so I calculate, I estimate that I have calculated this problem correctly. So let's consider another example uh, to calculate the mole fraction of tin in bronze. Now this involves a few concepts that we haven't covered in lectures yet, and so don't worry if you don't really know how to solve this problem yet. But I wanted to con include a chemistry problem just so you'd know something about how this works. So the problem is, a type of bronze is composed of 86% copper by mass. The balance of the bronze alloy is tin. What is the mole fraction of tin in this bronze? Now mole fraction is always a number that's less than 1. And so uh, to state the problem first, I want to know what is the mole fraction of tin? I'm going to want to calculate a number that's between 0 and 1. Now an approximate solution is that the mass fraction of tin must be 1 minus the mass fraction of copper, which is 0.86 or 86%, and so that's 14%. But what I'm actually after is the mole fraction of tin. Now each mole of tin weighs about twice as much as the mole fraction um, as a mole of copper, and so um, it's overly weighted in the mass fraction. So the mole fraction is going to be less than the mass fraction of tin, and by about a factor of two, because the mole, each mole of tin weighs about twice as much as the mole uh, fraction of uh, as a mole of copper. And so I expect in advance that the mole fraction of tin will be 7% or 0 0.07. And so I'm going to write XSN, which is a symbol for mole fraction of tin, uh, is going to be about 0 0.07. Okay, so now let's uh, review the data, which is step two. I know the mass fraction of copper is 0.86. I also know that the mass fraction of tin must be 1 minus 0.86 or 0.14. I can look up in the periodic table of elements that the molar mass of copper is 63.546 grams per mole, and the molar mass of tin is 118.71 grams per mole. So now I'm going to work backwards from uh, the answer that I want to obtain. The answer I want is the mole fraction of tin. And the way that I calculate mole fractions is to take uh, the number of moles of tin and divide by the sum of the number of moles of tin and the number of moles of copper. So in working backwards, I'm going to at some point have to get uh, the number of moles of copper and the number of moles of tin. Now, um, I can work back um, from the number of grams of copper and the number of grams of tin, tin and I know that I can convert that to moles using uh, molar masses. Uh, in order to calculate the number of moles of something, I take the number of grams and divide by the number of grams per mole, the molar mass, uh, to get the number of moles. And uh, so as I work back further, uh, I can calculate the number of grams of copper and tin if I know the mass fraction of copper and tin, if I know the mass of bronze. But I wasn't actually given the mass of bronze. So when I work forward, I can recognize that um, it really doesn't matter what the ma initial mass of bronze is. I can 
uh, start with any mass that I want because it's only the relative masses of copper and tin that are really going to count in uh, this problem. So now um, if I assume that I have 100 grams of bronze then I could calculate the number of grams of copper and the number a number of grams of tin in this sample. So I have a complete path to the solution and I can start by doing the math. If I assume uh, that I have 100 grams of bronze then I can calculate that I have 86 grams of copper, 14 grams of tin. Using the molar masses I know I have 1.35 moles of copper and, and 0.12 moles of tin. And using my formula here I can calculate that the number of the uh, mole fraction of tin is 0 0.0802. Now I had estimated 0 0.07 and what I actually calculated is 0 0.08 and so I have a reasonable value and the correct units in this case so I have a properly solved problem. The key is practice, practice, practice. So next time we'll talk about atoms and elements and lots of um, things having to do with the periodic table. We'll see you then.